My previous accounts have dealt mainly with research uses of digital media, Earl's Cone, Margo's ancestors, where one sets up a database of materials and people and researchers can come and use it. Here I want to talk about another kind of use of digital media which I've been interested in, which is basically for teaching and publication. I was brought up obviously in an era where there were really two ways in which you could reach people through teaching. At school and then at university, I learned that you received information either through written forms, through books, articles, newspapers and so on, or through spoken forms, particularly through teachers telling you things, or later at university through lectures and through supervisions or tutorials. And so gradually I absorbed the message that if I wanted to communicate as an academic or anyone else later on, I would have to do that through books, articles, and through lecturing. When I came to be a, an academic at Cambridge, I did all these things. I wrote books and articles and gave lectures. And this continued on through my first 10 years or so, from 1975. But at that time, I was just beginning to experiment with digital and other media, in particular with computers, with video disc, with microfiche publishing. And I began to be aware that perhaps one could think of other ways of communicating information for one's students and elsewhere. I started to tinker with making little films, for instance, particularly uh, in the end of the 80s, early 90s, about my work in Nepal. And as described elsewhere, I tried out little virtual fieldwork days with my students using film. And I began to use the video disc and other technologies like that. But it was still almost all analog media and still almost all lecturing and writing for published forms. I suppose it was around the year 2000, 2001, that the potentials of digital media as in education became really apparent. The changes which I've described elsewhere, the new storage, hard disks, the new computers, new editing software, and above all, the power of the internet. So, I think around 2002 or three, probably 2002, with Mark Turing and Sarah Harrison, who became the, in charge of my website, the webmistress, we started to look into the possibility of making a private website. Now, this was becoming quite widespread and popular and there were a number of books coming out about web design, how you'd make your own website. So I read these and thought about how best to organise it. And I decided that it should be nice and simple, with a front page, nice bright colours. Down one side would be particular projects, databases and so on, and some more across the top and then also a search bar across the top which would allow you to go down through a hierarchical system to a lower level. So there would be there's um, life, uh, in other words private and autobiographical and personal writings about my life. There's um, publications, films, uh, projects and so on across the top. Also a search system so you could find particular things, and a table of contents, so you could search it in that way. And at a, the next level there would be more detailed information about what you could find. So we designed this, and 
gingerly put it up and began to add bits and pieces to it. In particular, I added in terms of this talk two kinds of material. One was films of talks and lectures. Um, this was divided again into different parts. I was giving a number of talks in universities and uh, departments and so on, so I thought it would be nice to film these occasional lectures, as it were, and in particular the 18 lectures I gave in China in 2011 were filmed. And so there are a set of occasional lectures. People wouldn't necessarily be able to come to the Central University in uh, Europe or to my talks in Cambridge, and so I put these up, half a dozen or so, plus the China ones. Then, in 1983, in fact, I filmed my kinship lectures in the year when I stopped giving them, or had them filmed with by my young friends and colleagues and they just sat in a box and I thought well why not make those available so those were edited up into a series of films about an introduction to kinship and marriage and as I was now giving lectures or soon after giving lectures on another part of the first year undergraduate course on politics and economics um, a student Zilang Wang who filmed a number of my lectures filmed those for me kindly so we now had three institutions covered and Stephen Hugh Jones, who lectured for many years on religion and ritual, kindly let me us film his lectures. So we had uh, all the institutional parts of a first year course in social anthropology covered and Mark Turing's lectures on linguistics uh, were added and some I gave for a special topic on uh, material culture disease and um, famine and so on were added. So you really have a, a first year course as it was taught in Cambridge in the early part of the 21st century. I also lectured to second and third year students and I hadn't started this filming when I gave some of those courses but I kept, caught the last of them which were on legal anthropology, eight lectures on legal anthropology and eight lectures on the development of social science theories from Montesquieu through to Max Weber, Emile Durkheim, eight lectures which became one of the most popular of my lecture series when it was put, put onto YouTube. And I think it is one of the better sets because I was at the same time as giving them writing two books around them I'll talk about later. And so I had done quite a lot of work and the lectures were a synthesis of that longer writing. Finally, there were a set of lectures on methodology. One trains, I train students to go out and do anthropological field work. And I was surprised that there really wasn't any film on the web, and perhaps still isn't apart from this one, on how you do anthropological field work. You need, obviously, a camera in the field. You probably need two people, one filming, the other doing it. And that's what we had. So I made a very simple film, originally just for my students, and then I put it on the web. It's very crude, but it is about the only film about what field work is really like in a traditional community. And I gave lectures and introductions to things like visual anthropology, the ethics of field work, and so on. And these and other methodological films were put up. So altogether on this set of lectured lectures on uh, the internet there must be between 100 and 150 lectures. These were on my website and other people discovered them. They were copied onto prestigious American university websites, bits of them. Um, they were and are being uh, copied onto Chinese websites. So people around the world could come and watch these lectures, not all by me, of course. When I suggested to others that I might come and film a few other members of my department, 
they said, um, thank you, Alan, but no thank you. And I realised, as I realised with myself, that there are reasons for not doing this, obstacles. One is you don't want to do it early in your career when you're not, or too, too early in your career when you're not confident of your lecturing style. You don't want the world to see your fumbling attempts. Um, you may feel inhibited with having a camera there. You can't be spontaneous, you can't crack jokes which might not be taken in the right way by a wider audience, etc. Also, um, most academics reuse their lectures to a certain extent each year, and if you film it one year, surely your students will complain if they watch it and then see you giving the same lectures the next year. Furthermore, uh, will they come to your lectures if, if they're on the web? Why should they come, waste their mornings coming when they can spend an hour in their rooms watching it? These were all worries and they particularly apply to current lectures. I, they didn't apply to me so much. I was doing this in the last three or four years of my time at Cambridge and therefore this was in a sense an archival as well as an educational project. And I gathered the confidence I, through 20, 30 years of lecturing, I now could lecture without reading out texts and gain some rapport with the audience and I enjoyed it and this hopefully comes across fairly fluidly in the lectures. I also discovered to my surprise that even if they watched the lectures alongside me giving them, this didn't stop them coming. There's a different experience of hearing a lecture in a lecture room and watching it on the web. And people were grateful and said they'd missed a lecture and they could catch up on it or they could use the lecture series as a form of revision at the end of the year. So there were other uses for it as well as banking a whole set of teaching of a certain period of the late uh, 20th and early 21st century as an interesting historical archive as well as perhaps useful to those in Bangladesh or Uganda who couldn't make their way to my lectures. The other activity which um, I began to pursue was in publications. Now it was always the case that you published through printed media more or less but again it became apparent well before, perhaps 10 years before e-books and electronic books became the rage, that it should be possible to put up on the web various materials. And this was, in my case, of two main kinds. One was journal articles. Now, academics tend to publish in academic art, uh, journals, magazines, occasionally in the popular media. And these journals are expensive, uh, a few individuals buy them, but they tend to be in institutions and fairly we wealthy and Western institutions. So if someone, again in Assam, Bangladesh, Nepal or somewhere like that, wanted to read my articles, even if they're written about Nepal, they can't get them. How can they possibly come to a library in the West and find this journal? And so you get requests to send them, but and in the old days, you uh, journals printed lots of off prints, and academics sent them to each other. But now it would be just too cumbersome to send off articles all over the world, even if people knew who to write to. So I suddenly realised that I could, on my website, have a, an area of uh, off prints, as it were of my articles. So I arranged this area under themes, um, so population or kinship or economics or demography or whatever. So everything I'd written, both the articles and also books or films, were available under that. And it has the advantage that if someone's looking for what you've done in a certain field, they may find new things as well. Then it's arranged under methodologies, so encounters with social scientists or historians or uh, audiovisual or digital methodologies are grouped together uh, under that, those headings. And finally under 
areas of the world. So what I've written on Nepal or Japan or China or England is accessible in that way and all of it can be searched with the search system. The other advantage was that much of our work never finally comes out. I suppose only a third of what we write in articles and so on ever is published. One decides one's no longer interested, one doesn't have the time, um, the material is not of sufficient general interest, whatever it is, you stack away all these drafts of things you've worked on, which might be of interest to one or two people, uh, but aren't up to publication level. And the web suddenly makes this backstage production of unfinished, unpolished materials available. People have to be trusted to be sensible and to realise that this is not a finished product. And this is something which I started to experiment. So intermingled with the published versions are earlier drafts or unpublished drafts of other things. So you get a much completer set of materials of an academic which could be of interest to people here or there. This uh, is what one can do with articles and uh, journals, publications. Of course all sorts of copyright and other issues had to be worked out and it, it was around 2005 to 2010 that various conventions were worked out by journals about what rights the author had in pre-publishing or publishing alongside or post-publishing their academic journals and I've not had any problems with this. On the whole I've taken the view which I think most people do which is that if anything it will encourage someone to look at a journal if they find an article on the web from that journal. It won't um, stop them reading it or buying it. The other side was books. At first I thought, well, there's books are books and there's nothing much more you can do with them. This was before e-books. But quite soon after developing the website I realised that actually you can start to think of something new which you might call the web book. That is to say you have the published book published through a conventional publisher, which is for those who want to read it in the train or uh, in the library. But you give them supplementary materials which they might be interested in. Books are very good for the written word, and, but they're no good for really for visual things. Uh, even putting in many diagrams and pictures, photographs, is expensive. But anything moving, like a film, you can't really put in a book, obviously. And so I started to set up and publish books from the last six, seven, eight of my 20-odd books were designed in a way as web books. From the beginning I thought, well, I wonder what illustrative film material one could put with this, what other things one could do. And so a number of the books have uh, some of the reviews of the book and also a little website, for example, the book on tea. If you're reading a book on tea, you might want to go to a tea plantation and see how tea is made or how it's tested in Calcutta or have the reminiscences of a tea planter's wife, namely my mother, or whatever it is. And so there's a little website behind the tea, tea book and the same is true of several other books. The book on glass uh, has film about how glass is made and so on, which you can't really describe in a book properly. Two of the books had more elaborate websites. One was Letters to Lily, which from the beginning was designed as a more general book. It was written for my daughter, granddaughter Lily, and was on how the world works and was translated into a dozen languages and nearly became a bestseller, certainly sold a number of copies. And I thought it would be nice to have a, a website for the teenagers, young adults for whom it was written.
who could, uh, to begin with, blog and add their own comments, but we took that off for reasons, uh, obvious reasons that you're getting all sorts of unsuitable material being put up there. But also other things like the questions which Lily, I had imagined she might have written me some letters, so the letters she might have written asking the questions are there, or a bit of a reading of one or two of the letters to see how they worked as spoken in a spoken form and other things like that. And I also put up a blog on Blogspot where the book was distributed freely to those who might not ever be able to get a chance to look at it and read it, and 20 or 30 people a day read bits of letters to Lily around the world in that form. So that was one more elaborate website. The other one was behind a book which I started in about, um, well, started in 1993 and published 1997. So it took four years, real hard slog. This was The Savage Wars of Peace, Take Up the White Man's Burden, The Savage Wars of Peace. And this was comparing the history of Japan and England in relation to its material culture, to disease, to housing, to clothing, to food, to all those sorts of things, to try and see how these two islands dealt with perennial problems of that kind. And it took me into all sorts of areas about which I knew very little when I started, particularly medical history. And therefore it was a huge learning exercise. I was teaching myself these things. And also I didn't really know how to do it um, or where I was going for a long time. And so I thought maybe it would be interesting to not only write the book, but to keep a detailed set of field notes, as it were, of myself writing the book. So I kept detailed diaries, I kept the plans, I kept my thoughts as I went along about what I was doing and I kept early drafts of the book. And so I envisaged in the process maybe writing something about how the book was written. I looked at people's accounts, uh, social scientists, historians' accounts of how they came to write their books and I'd always felt unsatisfied with them. They seemed to gloss over the difficulties, they seemed to hint that they had known where they were going all the time, so to speak. And I knew from experience this wasn't the case. You really don't know what you're doing when you're doing creative research. And students were getting the wrong impression that um, academics just sat down and wrote their immortal prose, and there it was. Obviously, they, those who studied literature, um, poetry, uh, novels, uh, and so on, could go back to early drafts and see how the writer had changed things, but this wasn't at all common in the social sciences and humanities and arts. There were very few, if any, as far as I could see, accounts of how you actually write a book. And so I kept this, and on the website behind the book, there are not only films which show uh, the use of toilets in Japan or paper making or whatever the subject I was dealing with in the, in the book, uh, as with other books, but also the longest version of the book, which was a third over length, as books usually are in their first draft and have to be cut down. Also, um, many detailed appendices you can't put in a book, it's too expensive. And so we, these were put up as appendices for the few people who might be interested in um, child rearing in Japan or breastfeeding in England or whatever it was, a specialised subject. But also the autobiography of the book, that is the deep roots in one's earlier life, the first thoughts about what one was doing, and then the diary of actually writing the book and one's reflections at the end. So. This was all done well before the web, and no obvious way in which it could be published or made available, but the web made it possible, and it's been put up. Now that's web books. 
Another um, experiment, this was before ebooks came along, with Mark Turin, we thought it might be interesting to make a few texts freely available as PDF downloads and we took two of the books which were expensive and long, that is The Riddle of the Modern World and The Making of the Modern World, about five uh, great thinkers, Montesquieu, Adam Smith, de Tocqueville, Maitland and Fukuzawa, and we split up those books and made them freely available as downloadable PDFs. And I added another on Malthus, who I had never published a book on him, but I had written lots of piece, bits and pieces around the place, and I put that into a book. Later, these were republished as Kindle books in America, but this was anticipating that. So those were all different kinds of experiments and they are just beginning to test the possibilities of electronic publishing and every day new things come along and you have to keep up with this and experiment as it goes on and even in the last six months a year I've been experimenting with other things and I'll mention those as they're just on the forefront of what I'm doing now. One was electronic journal publishing with a journal called Fortnightly Review, a revival of a famous 19th century journal, the Fortnightly Review. This electronic journal has kindly started to issue a set of articles derived from my Chinese lectures on the invention of the modern world. There were 18 lectures, there are 18 articles, they're published fortnightly and what is interesting is that you can then put the film of the lecture which went with the article or was another version of the article alongside it along with some illustrations and so it is a part work which is using the power of electronic journals to distribute this. The book is being published in China but as far as I know not in England so that's one experiment. Another experiment which I may come out of this very set of talks and the writing behind it is with Book 2.0 which uh, Mick Gower and Mark Turin and others are developing where they're looking into the possibilities of digital publishing and I may experiment with that with, with these lectures and writings. And finally there's um, on-demand uh, desktop publishing one of the things that happens with academics is that they write quite a lot of um, things which are really not publishable. For a publisher, to, a commercial publisher or even a university press to publish a book, they've got to know that 500 to 1,000 people will buy this book or they price it very high and that uh, some dozens of libraries will buy it. And if it's very niche publishing, if it's only going to reach a few people, if it's going to reach a few people in England, India, Australia, China, then a commercial publisher or university press really can't afford to take it on. And so much useful, interesting work cannot be published. Um, the way around this for a number of writers, of course, in the past, has been what was sometimes called vanity publishing. You would find a small publisher, you would give them £2,000, they would produce 200 copies uh, in boxes and then you would give them away to your friends or um, sell a few copies and give away the rest and you were usually left with 100 copies which you couldn't distribute and £2,000 out of your bank account. That is okay but Suddenly new things are possible. I wrote a, a book with uh, Jamie Bruce Lockhart who went to school with me in the 1950s and this book was very long, in fact it was three books, it was a triptych, the dragon triptych, our home lives in two books and our joint experience at the dragon school in one book. 
combined the books are 1200 pages there are 200 illustrations or more and if one had tried to do it through vanity of publishing one would have to put for up to a three thousand pounds at least and be left with lots of copies but small desktop publishers in this case the village digital press uh, are springing up and you provide them with a PDF of the final, final thing which may, makes a lot of work for you but the publisher doesn't have upfront costs and if someone wants to buy a copy they then write to them it's on various sites and they print off a copy so it doesn't cost you anything in advance it doesn't cost the publisher anything in advance and the book is published I did the same with my mother's book which went out of press uh, out of print uh, Daughters of the Empire and it's now available around the world um, and that's a, a possibility which is emerging very quickly and you could I suppose do it yourself and so all sorts of ways of um, using the internet and digital media for publishing for education and so on are emerging and we now have to think not only in the present, but in 20 years' time, what will it be like? And those are my particular experiments.